Hi, welcome to another episode, Coffee and Codeless with me, Gary Hoberman. And for those, uh, first off, the guests we have on today, which is going to be an amazing conversation. There are so many people reached out, excited to hear him speak that I'll just give the overview of what the series is about. The series is about bringing leaders that have incredible stories to share with you. And that's it. This is zero about on cork or the journey we've been on it's about each of our journeys and, and this one is going to be especially fun because right before the session i got a text from a friend saying there was a picture of sid and sid ball is joining us here from bank of new york and it was it was sid um sid speaking at an event that's called punks and pinstripes and the the message i got was the photo of sid and saying he's on your show next which courses today. But Sid and I met a um, little background at an event called Punks and Pinstripes where um, we both have a mutual friend, Greg, who's created this amazing organization of, of I would say, people who want to change the world who are in a corporate world today. And, you know, we'll, we'll change the world either there or outside. But um, I spoke at a previous event, and that's when I got to meet Sid, who had an amazing story to share. I'm wearing my rebel jacket for Greg just because we were on stage at Jacob Javits pretty recently together. And and this was my new look. This is my rebel look, I guess you could say. Maybe this will be my coffee and colorless look. But but Sid, I'm gonna stop there and just like tell us who you are. Give us your story, the background. We'll talk a little bit about BNY Mellon and your role there and just um tell us. Yeah, please. No, it's, it's it's great being here, Greg. Uh, a lot of times uh I meet certain people that I feel very comfortable talking to, and I'm really glad that we got this opportunity to connect. And uh, yeah, well, Punks and Pinstripes is really a rebel executive network that Greg founded. And uh, I think it was born of the realization that transformation in organizations is hard. And uh, when you go on LinkedIn, for example, you hear a lot of the stories of celebration and accomplishments and uh, people talking about great things that they've done, but you don't really hear about the hardships. Uh, what does it mean to encounter obstructionism in organizations? How do you do enterprise-wide transformation? Um, and I think that it was born out of that need for us to kind of commiserate in a way and also share our stories about, you know, what are the playbooks that make those uh, transformations successful? Uh, so that's been really fulfilling to, you know, whenever you find your tribe and you've got a like-minded network of people, uh, you have the capacity for tremendous amounts of change. And I think that's what we're we're looking to do it. It's been very fulfilling um, to be part of that. Um, I think the the overall theme of that also ties into something. I've, I've always felt like a bit of an outsider in corporate America. Um, I think one of the realizations for me is that as we've transitioned from the 20th century into the 21st, um, humans haven't necessarily come along for the ride, right? It's It's been a very uh, insidious kind of subtle transformation that we don't pay attention to, but it's transformed. Uh, what I mean by that is that the structures to get work done in the 20th century were very much that of the industrial age and, and the factory, right? So specialization and roles and hierarchies. Um, and then at the end of the last century, the internet came along and suddenly information wasn't hierarchical anymore. It's distributed, right? So you saw the rise of things like open source and people working from anywhere and collaborating and building cool things, uh, you know, but it was a very distributed information architecture, right? And um, when you look at how information flows today, there is no monopoly on information. It, it can come from anywhere. And I think you have to lean into that and have a way that you're able to harness the power of that. And you'll find that the companies that have built cool products um, or have delivered excellent customer experiences really understand that concept because what you see is a magnification of the notion that information is distributed and information is not proprietary, right? So the more you share, and that's kind of what's driving the content uh, economy these days is the more you share, the more powerful you become versus the more you hoard, the more powerful you are, right? It's a, so there's a distinct difference between the 20th century model and the, what I believe to be the 21st century model, but we're still learning in, in large enterprises and large organizations. And, where you see the uh, disconnect between a transformative force, especially if you're doing something like a digital transformation is, is really that immune system kicking in that, that's built on the old model, um, coming up against something that's new and, and changing simply because those information models haven't been fully adopted yet. 
You know, Sid, that's, um, I, there was an article at CIO.com, I think just a week or two ago, they, I got a little bit of input, even though I'm an alumni CIO, I got in there and my message was, um, if you're making change, there should be 15 people's names that want to run you over with a truck. Like that's the, if you're, and your job as a technology leader is make change because otherwise we'll all still be using steam machines, right? What's the point of moving? But it's interesting to see, um, that, that drive. And there aren't many people that recognize it. So um, I know we talked about, you know, your, um, I love behavioral economics books and behavioral theory books and just like stepping back and thinking how crazy humans actually are in many ways and predictable, like that's a great yeah. book, predictable rationality. Um, like, and that's your, your interest as well. Right. And that's what your, what, what is your favorite book is, do you have a favorite book that you're, you're you'd recommend everyone to read in that space? Well, I was surprised at a recent gathering that I ran into a whole bunch of people who hadn't read The 48 Laws of Power. Um, I believe, so this is an interesting thing for me because when I first started my career, um, everyone hated politics. You know, I didn't run into anybody who likes politics. But um, I heard a saying that says, whenever you have three people in a room, there's politics. Um, and the very simple reason for that is everybody, everyone has different values, different incentives. Uh, different behaviors and different culture. And when you put those in a, in a room, you have to have tension, right? Uh, but tension is good because when you can harness that for creative output, you can do some great things. Uh, but I've always been a student of human behavior and human dynamics. And uh, what better lab for that than a Fortune 500 corporation, right? Um, but I think it's important to acknowledge and understand people. Uh, I call this hacking humans. And I think if you if you want to be transformative, it's really important to understand that at the end of the day, everything that we do is a human endeavor, right? We might be on the brink where that's no longer true because our AI counterparts will be part of the mix as well. But a lot of it is human behavior and human dynamics and what drives people. I find um, I have a tremendous amount of curiosity about that. And um, if I was to look back on things that I've been able to drive transformation and it's very much been a function of uh, the humans who are involved more than anything to do with technology you know it's interesting because we with all the generative ai speak and hallucination speak and when i as soon as you heard the word hallucination i dug, dug in and said this is if you understand it from a human perspective and what that means it's the machines have an advantage over us in that there are sixty thousand machines all learning and when one person one machine learns something they share it immediately with the other fifty nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine, and they all now know it and yeah. humans don't Humans are the exact opposite. Um, if I'm in a job and I want to basically keep that job forever, I'm going to keep what I know forever internalized and not share it. And we, oh, I'm sure you've seen that. I've personally seen we're coming in to automate a job that should be automated and only 25% of the requirements shared to the technology team. Like 75% were kind of whittled in slowly over time and for years. You never could achieve it. And yeah. I've lived through that and that's, so the machines have a big advantage. Hallucinations to me are more like if we all learn the way, like I just learned something and you immediately knew it and you learned something and I knew it, like that's what the machines are doing, which are right or wrong. Like they'll figure it out. We, we are stopping ourselves. I agree completely. And I've seen a hundred times over the, the machine and the bureaucracy inside of a company try to eat up that innovation. I didn't, I didn't ask, like, let me ask innovation groups, central innovation groups, good or bad within a company. What do you think? Uh, I, well, I, I really think you've got to understand it. for me, innovation is really about business outcomes. And, you know, part of this is the fact that I, I believe in capitalism. Yeah. So you, if you're doing something um, that's innovative, it's really got to deliver some kind of economic benefit. Right. Uh, so I'm not a huge fan of science experiments. And what I find um, where I've seen innovation models work is where you have a spectrum of um, approaches to how you approach innovation. And it's a combination of, you know, you're doing business development, are you doing M&A, are you doing uh, incubators, are you doing uh, accelerators and some kind of spectrum of, if you have a spectrum or portfolio view of how you approach innovation, you're probably going to get some ideas that blend into how you want to run your business and they're going to transform your business. Uh, not in an incremental way, right? Uh, but a lot of those times, I think those are baked in. You'll be surprised how many great ideas come out of teams that are, you know, heads down deep into a problem where that leads to some kind of enlightenment that says, here's a better way to uh, engage with customers. Here's a better way.
better way to drive our business forward. Um, I don't think that this, the notion of having, yeah, I don't think that notion of having an innovation czar, uh, there is no monopoly on innovation, right? Um, and so I, I think it's really Im important to drive a culture of innovation. And the way that I, I like to prove this is if you went and did man on the street interviews with anybody and said, tell me an innovative company, right? You're going to get a short list of names. Uh, or if you go to people and say, tell me an innovative country, you're going to get a short list of names and it's going to be the same names over and over again. And why is that? Uh, you know, here's where it comes back to the human element. Uh, it really is culture. And for me, culture is a math equation. It's um, culture is a set of behaviors and values that are driven by incentives. And if you take apart that equation and, and kind of discriminate between what you can control and what you can't, there's, what you can really control is the incentives and the incentives drive behavior. So you, if you want to transform your culture, which is you know the hard problem in enterprises, it's what kind of incentive systems are you setting up? The, and the classic yeah. parable I use, and by the way, the, the example, if, if you travel globally, uh, the one sign I use to tell me the kind of culture that I'm dealing with is I look at trash cans. And if the trash can is overflowing, it tells you something about the culture you're dealing with, right? It's a culture that allows the trash can to overflow. And there are some cultures where you will not see a overflowing trash can and some cultures where you will and that's a pointer to the fact that your culture is the worst thing that you tolerate. And what you tolerate will drive, you know, behaviors and, and outcomes. And there are some cultures that are group based that will not allow that to happen. And some cultures that are individual based where, you know, become somebody else's problem. So again, you know, a lot of this is human dynamics, but I think if you want innovation, you really have to drive the culture and behaviors and incentives that allow innovation to happen. You know, it's interesting. So um, completely agree. And I, I know when I see this outside in, I lived it inside out where in banks, you know, I'm using them as an example, we both work in and have worked in before and work with, but um, incentives. So the more people that work for you, the more money you will make personally. Like if you have a thousand people, you, you'll get this. And if you have 10,000 people, you'll get much more, you know, this times two. And it's the exact reverse incentive. It's it's the and I've I've had this. I've had a bank CIO once tell me, "What are my ten thousand engineers going to do tomorrow if I deploy on Quark? Because it makes them all more effective and efficient." Mm -hmm. And like and what she was really saying was, "What am what's my bonus going to be? Like what's my because ideally they're all going to still be doing that plus more, and more efficiently and better." Like, but it was, uh, it becomes personal and the incentives have to align and it should be the exact opposite. It's like the less people that you have in your team, the more you get paid <laughs> because you're more effective and figure out how to do it. It's really interesting. And, and Sid, we jumped straight in as I knew we would, I have to back up. So what is your role today at BNY? What, um, how did you get there in the journey to get there? And where was BNY always your home and, and really give us, give us your story. Oh, so um, in terms of my origin story, I've always been an accidental tourist in technology. Uh, going back to my earliest encounters with technology, it was always by accident. Um, I, in the ninth grade, I happened to be uh, number 25 in a class of students that was selected to do computer science, where only 24 of them actually qualified based on grades and other, other criteria. And my teacher walked into class, pointed at me and said, you're number 25, right? Just randomly. Uh, that started my journey in computer science. Uh, when I went to college, for example, I wanted to be a chemical engineer. And I had a professor just show up and tell me, you're going to change your major to computer science. And here's the change of major form. And I've already signed it. And I need you to sign it. Because he saw, he saw that's where my future was going to be, right? Uh, and continuously, uh, even in my first job, uh, my boss asked me, he's like, do you consider yourself a programmer? And I said, no, <laughs> which is crazy because I love code. I really love code and I love everything that technology has to offer. Um, but my first job when I graduated was at CERN. And uh, this was in 96, just two years after the web had been invented at CERN. Uh, so, you know, no better place to dive into technology. And I loved it. I got to work with lots of data. Um, 
entire stack of the TCP IP protocols that were existing at the time, um, doing a lot of low level programming as well as data programming. And um, it was a great way to see uh, things that were being done and also the early days of the inception of the LHC, which eventually discovered the Higgs boson. So really exciting foundational work um, at CERN, uh, definitely a cherished part of my career. Um, and then fell into finance in, in pretty much by accident where I had, uh, you know, I had done consulting in the early part of my career and then decided to quit corporate jobs called Turkey, uh, did some cool side projects, pitched a startup to Paul Graham, um, during which I learned that what I wanted to do was something that would probably be done by Facebook. And I'd never heard of Facebook before. So that's how I got my first Facebook account from hearing that. Uh, but then shortly thereafter, I got a call from people I'd worked with at Lehman asking me to join Lehman. And I was initially not interested, but then I discovered they were doing some really cool work around um, fixed income risk models. Um, so I went there to build uh, some of the code around VAR calculators and so on for fixed income risk. And of course, that was right before Lehman collapsed. So definitely a learning experience for me. Uh, one of my favorite quotes, by the way, from uh, from Fisher Black, who developed the Black-Scholes model, is that uh, the universe looks very different from the banks of the Hudson than it does from the banks of the Charles. Um, you know, and I saw that firsthand because my education in finance uh, at NYU did not prepare me for what I saw at Lehman. Uh, very much in education in real life applications of finance. Um, and since then, I've spent my career at a number of other institutions, including Goldman, Barclays, and TIA before I came to uh, to the Bank of New York Mellon. Um, I was telling the punks the other day, by the way, that it's important uh, not to respect your job description for fears it will stifle you. And uh, I find myself very fortunate in large organizations because I have this mental image of an aircraft carrier. and. You know, if you work on an aircraft carrier, you can get very tied into being in the engine room or sweeping the decks or preparing the planes for flying or whatever your job is, right? And if you just take a step back and look at the whole ship, you say, wow, I'm, I'm on this aircraft carrier. And it's a tremendous place for learning and experiences. And that's what I feel like in large enterprises is that there's a tremendous amount of opportunity, uh, learning and uh, all kinds of fascinating things that are going on. So I've always been curious about walking around and finding out what's going on. Um, I'm also a huge believer in talent. So what I, uh, I love building, you know, great teams. And when I first came to the bank, I started exploring what we were doing with cloud and, um, realized that we had an opportunity to build something cool. So I've been spending the last few years building, uh, an enterprise vision for cloud. So I'm currently the head of cloud at the bank. I'm also accountable for, um, our newest business in data and analytics, which is based on platforms that we run like uh, Eagle and Vault, uh, which are data management and accounting and performance capabilities for our clients. Um, so very interesting purview across uh, capabilities in both data as well as cloud. And, you know, where we are with cloud is, um, is interesting. There's a part of my brain that always says, whenever you see the word cloud, just replace it with the word computer and it won't be as scary. Um, Right, but uh, we've we've had to take a journey um, in financial services with understanding cloud as it relates to us, especially around things like our risk posture and so on. So that's been um, you know that's been very fulfilling in terms of being able to go after those hard problems and solve them, uh, especially at an enterprise level. Yeah, that's interesting. So um, something I always saw missing in corporate world was the idea of that risk reward chart. Like, and in a startup world, it's you live by it every minute of every day. It's what's the risk you're willing to take for that reward and how do you control that risk? And and many, many banks since the recession 2007 have gone so far backwards that the, the risk is not there, right? That's, and like they, they won't take the risk because there's no reward big enough for what. It's interesting to see that, and that's a culture thing. That's what you said before is culture. It's uh, we've gotten, um, with, you know, you have amazing new leadership at BNY. So Robin Vince had come and spoke similar in a similar session to our internal employees before mm -hmm. he joined BNY and amazing leader. And we have some, uh, ex on Cork employees who are helping him 
as he took on that role and, and drove this, which are amazing. And like, it's interesting to see where BNY and I, I, a lot of what I'm seeing and what you're describing is they're going to hopefully push the limits a little bit, take that risk and no, control um, the risk. Like, I'm loving what I'm seeing, by the way. And if, if anyone wants to know what BNY Mellon is up to, I recommend reading our last annual report. Um, it's a pretty honest assessment of our strengths and the opportunities ahead. Um, I think it definitely sets the tone for what we're trying to do as a bank. Uh, lots of very exciting things. And, uh, you know, we're, we're aware and recognizing our position in the financial services ecosystem uh, is very client focused, uh, very much with a view of where we can leverage our strengths, but also, you know, bring, uh, bring ourselves to the uh, show with, um, you know, showing up as a, as a complete bank, right across all of our services. That's uh, and I think that's a message that resonates with a lot of us who are trying to make, uh, make change here. That's amazing. And you know, it's interesting. So cloud is an analogy we use a lot whenever we're, we're telling a customer like, here we're, we're kind of the sitting above the cloud. We're extending the cloud to apps. That's cloud is, as you said, it's a compute. It's, you know, it's, it's an abstraction. It's so you, you've seen it. What was your first language going back to that day when I like the way, by the way, I wish I had professors like you. I mean, I'm shocked a professor handing you a, a like transfer and go, go into computer science. Yeah. You know, what was the language you actually started to learn at that point? C or. So something? when I was 14, I wrote basic. Uh, and the coolest what was thing it on? I got to ask, what was the machine? It was a, it was an IBM clone. Probably okay. uh, 286, um, probably yeah. 286, yeah. Um, with a monochromatic screen that had a five and a quarter inch uh, floppy boot disk. Um, you know, I remember uh, those very, well. Very, I took apart those. I used yeah. to play with those, you know, when you, yeah. they, 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 and they would always stop working. <laughs> there was no yeah. guarantee of storage. <laughs> yep. And uh, the coolest thing that I learned in BASIC was that uh, there was a command called motor. Uh, and you could use it to hook it up to external hardware and run external hardware, right? So um, it, it kind of extended the periphery of what a computer was for me. Um, and then when I went to, when I was taking the professor who made me change my major, I was actually learning Pascal. And I was completely befuddled by this concept of what they called uh, in parameters, out parameters, and in out parameters, you know? and uh, it was it was a conceptual leap for me until I took the Pascal manual and read it cover to cover, and I was like, "Oh, this is a thing that maintains its state when you when you're using it when you're referring to it outside of the procedure that you invoked it in." Okay, that's what it is. But why didn't they just tell me that? Uh, you know. So, but I've embarked on a on a journey of discovery after that. It got into C plus plus, Visual Basic for some time, and then heavily into Java, right? And my my approach with any language has always been, well, first of all, I, I do have a belief that technology is technology and business is business. For me, like none of this matters. Like I could be in any business or any technology and it doesn't matter to me. Uh, because once you understand some fundamental concepts, it's a matter of translation, you know, to semantics and syntax. But um, yeah, I really enjoyed Java. Um, at CERN, we used Fortran and a little bit, but mostly a Python, Perl, a whole bunch of other things. Um, most recently, I've started to code in Flutter, um, and I like I like Flutter and Dart uh, for sure. I think it brings a new element in terms of how you build apps. That's so. Would you? That's interesting. So Flutter versus like React and React Native, and uh, for those who don't know, Flutter is a really. It's funny. I remember when um, Acrobat came out with Flash. Like it was Macromedia Flash at the time yep. in Adobe, but Flash was this like game changing. We used to have to choose between a thick client VB application or C++ or a web application. And here's this combination magical, you could run rich experience inside the browser and it's uh and you know, without like in your, I'm curious your views on Flutter. Is it that approach or is it truly the migration you see everyone moving to? Like, what's your views? I don't necessarily. Oh, so we should talk about this. Uh, I think. So, so speaking about codeless, right? In in terms of a codeless world, I think a codeless world is really a mathematical representation of uh, what computational logic should be, right? 
Uh, yes. And I like that yeah. because for me, to be mathematical in programming is to be functional. And I think for many years we were, I'll say something controversial now, but for many years we were misdirected through object-oriented programming. Um, <laughs> you know, I think... It. I think object-oriented programming was kind of cool, but unnecessarily complex because we didn't, we hadn't grasped yet the notion that uh, most most code is really passing messages from one place to another, and those messages contain data. And if you can understand it in mathematical terms as functions with input parameters and outputs, uh, and uh, and have a functional model of how that all ties together, uh, you have code that's more deterministic, right? A lot of the non-deterministic nature of uh, code comes from unexpected behavior of, you know, those objects. And um, so I'd love to see a more functional world for sure. And as an example, I, I remember writing some code recently in Spring and I discovered that Spring had, you know, improved since I'd first uh, written code in it, but finders in Spring are pretty cool, right? You connect you connect them to a data source and you can write in plain English a finder function that will automatically write the code that goes and gets the data you want uh, sorted and filtered the way you want it, right? But then I discovered that you could write functions in, in MongoDB directly, functions as a service that do the same thing, uh, infinitely more scalable, right? So rather than scaling out your uh, Spring code base, you can scale out a function and you know be, be way more effective. So I, I'd love to see... Uh, you know, if I was to teach students programming from scratch, I'd probably encourage them to think functionally because I believe functional code is more testable as well, right? Because you know, you know what your inputs and outputs look like. Um, I uh, I completely agree, and I learned Haskell before creating on Quark. So to me, I wanted to understand functional, and it was re rewiring a procedural brain that I had for twenty years to basically understand functional programming and closure and go and. And uh, it's interesting. So, like, there is um, we we won a huge client recently, major financial institution. And um, when we went back and asked the CIO, like, we asked a question always, like, we thank and say, what was, you know, we did a lot of pitches and demos and POCs, and we build out and we should have worked. We said, what was the thing that got you over the hump? And what he said was, he views us simple. It's we have engineers. He's like, I trust you have better engineers I could hire in a financial institution you know, you're a startup, you're attracting better. And he goes, your engineers are coding that function once. I mean, use your word function. So you're coding it once and your team's coding it. We're using it, but not just us using it, but every one of your other clients is using it across the government and sectors. And so we assume it's been tested well, secured well. And we assume if there are issues, others probably already found it before us. So it's, it's really interesting because going back, like in every demo I do, we we built an inheritance in Onquark. So we said, and the way I talk about inheritance is we did object oriented the right way. Mm -hmm. And I, that's exactly what I say, because like you, the promise of object oriented was a great promise and the implementation sucked completely. It was done wrong. Every attempt was done wrong. And so our view of the world is like, you could take anything and build it into a, your own function and you could expose it for reuse. but. The consumer could choose to reuse it as a copy and uh, change it, override, or you. the consumer could say, I'm going to reference it, but I want to choose when to apply your update. So I'm letting you own the master, but I'm going to only choose when to apply your changes. Or the consumer could say, I'm going to take everything you do blindly because I trust you. And it's that piece is too hard to implement in an object-oriented world. That was the one which was like, we, we always say that. I love that, by the way. So. So said you and I could go technically, as you could see, we would just could go for hours and hours. There's no question here. I see in the comments, Greg joined us, which is awesome. I see Megan joined us, which is awesome. And so like no pressure here. Said so, like, you've got a lot, but um, give us, give us your, your last, you know, someone listening to this, they want their, let's assume that they're climbing that corporate ladder and like you, their goal is, I believe this company I'm part of could change the world or do something bigger. And, probably like you and, and myself also believe at some point, maybe like you could actually leverage that company to do it, or maybe you'll jump out and do it yourself and drive that and, and do that and, and figure out the direction and drive. So what would be your career life advice you'd give them? I'm curious. Um, well, I have a 
So part of part of everything I do in technology is really about humanizing the experience, right? I don't believe that technology should be separate from humans. We just have to integrate the two. But part of my focus on human humanistic uh, behavior and also humanizing experiences is that I strongly believe that every human has a unique set of talents and capabilities. A lot of that is brainwashed out of us in education. So, you know, I, I recommend take a strong look at your education and whether it's adding value to you or, but we all have a unique perspective on the world um, and you have to let that light shine. So I, I really recommend spending a lot of time in introspection and understanding your values and what makes you who you are. But then once you figure that out, and sometimes that takes years and decades to figure it out, but you have to let that light shine. And what that means is taking that unique perspective and talent and turning it into some kind of creative output. You know, I do believe that we're all artists um, and we have to figure out what it is that makes us uh, hum, right? In, in terms of what is that creative output that I was destined to do and, and do that. Now in a corporate context, I think, you know, I definitely am not a huge fan of the latter. Uh, I think if you can go into an environment and let your light shine uh, and show where you bring value, that value gets recognized. Um, and I'm also a believer that if you have to go where you're celebrated, not tolerated. So if you find that it's the wrong context, you know, switch contexts. Uh, as, as programmers know, context switching is an expensive operation, but, um, you know, it's worth it if you can find yourself in the right environment. Uh, part of it is also finding the tribe, right? Find the people you want to surround yourself with, find the mentors you want to learn from. Um, I believe in working with people that you enjoy working with. So I'm, I'm fortunate to have that here at the bank. I, I work with a lot of people that I really enjoy working with. They're, they're friends. Um, it makes things a lot easier. You know? So, but I think um, definitely another, another tie back to what we started the conversation with is discard all notions of 20th century career paths. Um, I don't believe that a four-year education will prepare you for the world four years from now, right? So you have to create and innovate and invent the future uh, in your own image. I like it. There's, um, it's really interesting. So there was a song my kids were playing on the radio, like, and it's an old song that they put on called Flowers Are Red, which is like, and it's an old, old folk song. And like, I'm, I don't remember it growing up, but they, maybe the school played it, but it's all about the, the child being told by the school that like flowers have to be red and he's coloring it in like rainbow colors or whatever, green. And like, and like, it's, it's about, I love that going after and changing and celebrating where you will win. Um, and like, you always will find a better opportunity out there. That's what I believe is like, there's always something better from where you are today. So strive for that. Don't lock yourself in. Um, so that's amazing, amazing feedback. I mean, I'm just, uh, this is, I'm waiting for the book. Can, is there a book coming out? Come on, you could do it. You could, uh, yeah. you've, this, and uh, uh, yeah, go ahead. Speaking of yeah, speaking of creative output, I mean, I mean, uh, there's there's a book lurking in the back of my brain, but it needs to be manifested into reality for sure. Okay, if there's any ghostwriters that are that are watching this, you know what to find. Said this is good LinkedIn, and uh, that's that's awesome. I would I would definitely read it. There's no question there. And uh, so so this is said again. Thank you for joining, and I look forward to seeing you at another one of Greg's events. And I'll be wearing I wear only for Greg. I wear this jacket, or I don't know. Maybe that's my new look. I don't know, but we'll we'll figure it. Out. And it's it's great to see you again. And I look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you for joining us here and sharing all your insights. And Likewise, and by the way, thank you for everything you're doing for the ecosystem, Gary. It's great. I we're we're Remember. pushing together. We're pushing hard, right? And that's it. You have to basically go upstream. And uh, this is awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. See you in another episode. Take care. Thanks, bye -bye. everyone, for joining. Yeah.